Well, welcome to our Wednesday night worship service. Uh, We're so grateful that we've got the technology where for those of you that can't be here in person, you can still stream this at home. And we really look forward to the day, hopefully soon, when we can all once again be gathered back here. I want to encourage you, uh, the worship at home has a little more distractions than we might have here in Wood Hall. So we'll move those out of the way. And may God, through the worship music and the Bible study this evening, build you up and prepare you to serve Him even more.
and remembering and wondering over the reality of knowing the God of the universe, the God who made us, and the God who didn't give up on us. Uh, it is an amazing love indeed, Lord, and uh, an amazing grace, and we pray that we would understand it more fully as we explore your word, because uh, Jesus Christ lives, and he has sent his spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Guys, um, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. Um, you know, there is a parents' night out tomorrow night uh, where um, th the format is you come and you hear a little discussion about a topic and then you leave and then come back and get your kids. Uh, I, I think it's from 6 to 8 or 6.30 to 8.30, something like that. But anyway, tomorrow night. And they're going to talk about um, how to have the conversation with your children about sex and sexuality. So, um, you know, we, we had three girls and, and I believe in sex education in the home, as long as my wife did it. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a, a subject of great import and difficulty, so come be a part of that as they uh, hopefully can give you uh, a nice discussion and maybe, you know, an hour or so away from the kids, free of charge, by the by. And then uh, a new members class, which is a week from this Sunday, um, obligates you to nothing, but it is a step that one must take if one is ever interested in um, membership here at Grace of Anne. So that's, uh, there's lunch, it's after the second service, there's free lunch, it's in boxes so that we can be pure. And, um, and so, and, and we're, we commit to be out of here by 2.30 to you, so take us up on it. Now, go back with me to uh, Exodus chapter 5, and let's continue our study of the life of Moses. Um, I want to read you just the first three verses of uh, Exodus chapter 5, verse 3, and then we'll look at a few things before we close. Here we go. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? 
I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with sword. Um, we're going to look at just a few, uh, hopefully, helpful applications out of that, those three verses. Um, so, and then we'll move further perhaps next week. But gang, um, this is an account of the first, the initial audience that Moses and Aaron has, has with Pharaoh. And you know, you just don't go bopping into the Pharaoh's office and, and have a conversation with him. But it is suggested that, you know the story about how Moses was in the, in the little ark in the water and, and Pharaoh's daughter came and rescued him. And he, there, it is suggested that the Pharaoh and Moses knew each other. That they had been raised in the same home, the same family at the same time. And they were roughly the similar, of similar age. And uh, that does at least give you some kind of explanation as to how uh, Moses gained immediate audience with the, the Pharaoh. Um, Gang, uh, there, is, um, there is an opening salvo here in verse 1, and it says, thus says the Lord. Now, gang, um, you know, I pointed this out to you before, but anytime you find Lord in all caps, like you find it there, that is a translation of a Greek, I mean, a Hebrew term called um, Yahweh, yod heh vav um, And so this is a, uh, thus says Yahweh. Um, that formula is the calling card of the prophets, but it is more than just that. It is a statement of authority. Thus says Yahweh, as opposed to any other. <coughs> and the, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> the initial request is to allow them to go out three days and carry on a worship service. Uh, the word, the word a feast is used in verse 1, and a, uh, the word sacrifice is used in verse 3. They are requesting to have a worship service uh, after out in the wilderness. Um, it's interesting, gang, I think, that the thing that God is most interested in his people doing is worshiping. Uh, they are to go out there and worship. Um, you, you see here the priority of worship. <laughs> and gang, um, you see the same thing in the New Testament. Do you remember the, the conversation that Jesus had with the, the woman at the well? And, um, you know, he had just told her that she has too many husbands. And, and she says, oh, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. I, I wonder how she figured that out. But, um, uh, and uh, then he, she says, uh, you know, our fathers tell us to worship on this mountain, and your fathers say to worship on that mountain. Which mountain do we worship on? And Jesus says uh, to her, as you probably remember, um, but the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. <clears throat> the Father is seeking worshipers. Gang, um, the Bible knows nothing of a converted soul that does not engage in corporate worship. Um, you've heard it said by some, and I heard it just this past week. They said, uh, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing. Um, you might be... Um, you might be alienated, disillusioned. I get all that. You might have been hurt by a church. I get all that. But eventually, you've got to get healed and get back to the people of God. You know, I, I, I pointed that out Sunday morning in that Acts uh, 2 passage that God saved people. He was adding to what? He was adding to the church. Um, save people, he adds to the church. So, what you see here is, a, again, the priority of worship. We want to go out there and worship. Because that's who the Father is seeking, a, a community of worshipers. <clears throat> now, um, to that request, Pharaoh replies, Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh. <clears throat> G 
Gang, our culture responds the same way when we say, thus saith the Lord, too. Our, our, our culture responds, what, 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 who, who, who is Yahweh? I do not know Yahweh. And this becomes, gang, one of the themes of the rest of the book of Exodus. Because um, Pharaoh and Egypt, they're about to get to know Yahweh. Um, th this statement in 7.5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against uh, Egypt and bring out the people of Israel among them, from among them. Um, no, you don't know Yahweh, but we're going to be in some way introduced through those plagues, which we'll get to later on. Now, gang, <clears throat> I'm going to do something now that I've done before here. Um, I hope it doesn't bore you. Um, there's nothing worse than boring people uh, with the truth of God, but um, I, I, I just want you to know that I do it because I think it's important, and I'll show you why I think it's important before I quit doing it, but it has to do with this idea, I do not know Yahweh. Gang, uh, when we read that, uh, we impose a, a, uh, an understanding on the word no, K-N-O-W, that the Bible doesn't particularly mean. And that becomes really important, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. But gang, the, the, the Hebrew word is, um, is yada. Um, you find it used several places in the Old Testament. For instance, in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, and Adam knew Eve, uh, and she conceived and bore Seth. Now, gang, there's the word, yada. Um, what happened in that tent that night? Um, were they introduced? Did uh, Adam enter, go in there and say, good evening, madam, I'm Adam? What happened? Well, whatever it was, it produced a child. It was a procreative event. You go to um, Genesis 19, and you remember that's when the angels came to Sodom and were going to extract Lot out of there, and uh, these perverts banged on the door and said, uh, let us have those men in there that we may know them. What did they want? To have a little fellowship? No, ladies and gentlemen, it's the term yada. And the father responds by saying, um, <clears throat> no, I've got, to, I got a couple of girls, a, a couple of daughters that have never known a man. Well, what, is, what, is the, what does the author mean there? But it's the term yada. I found a new one <clears throat> this, um, this week. It's in 1 Kings. Remember, David is old and dying. Um, and he, it, he's having trouble getting warm. And so somebody comes up with the bright idea. Let's get a, a, a woman um, to you know, lie next to him and get some body warmth. And the, so they find this woman, Abishag, the Shunammite, and was brought to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. Well, what is that all about, ladies and gentlemen? It's, it's the same term, yada. Um, in, in all of those instances, um, what, you, what you see is a richer, fuller, deeper understanding of the word to know. Remember, that's where I, I'm coming out of Pharaoh's statement. Um, I do not know Yahweh. <clears throat> um, this is, um, but all three of those have kind of a sexual overtone. What's the matter with you, young? Are you kind of a pervert? Uh, what's the matter? What? No, here's another, here's another instance. This is in Amos chapter 3. Uh, you only I have known of all the families of the earth. God says that to Israel. Of all the families of the earth. I've only known you. I mean, did, was he not aware of Egypt or Assyria? Of course he was. But the idea of to know, ladies and gentlemen, is to communicate something deeper and richer and more intimate. To know is to, is to engage in intimacy of relationship. Now, 
Here's why I did it again, and here's why I think it's important. We go to the New Testament, and Jesus says this, and this is eternal life, that they may know you. (laughs) Gang, of course, the New Testament's written in Greek. I think you know that. It's not the, the Hebrew term, yada. It's the word gnosko. But the richness of the term abides. Um, you want to know what eternal life is? To know God. But you see, preachers like me always make this distinction. I'm not sure people are listening. But to know means something more intimate. Um, eternal life is not some kind of informational exercise whereby you gather all kinds of neat little facts as to how big God is and, and, and how large. No, you know. No, to know God is to love God. I'm not seeking an informational relationship. I'm seeking a personal, intimate relationship. Um, Guys, I'm teaching systematics this coming Saturday, Lord willing, if we can all stay healthy. Um, Why am I going to do that? So that we can stuff people's heads with more information about God? No. I'm teaching it so that they can know God. In all of his beauty, in all of his sovereignty, in all of his immensity. But I want them to know him in this yada sense. Not in some kind of foolishness of saying, you know, you've got, you're smarter than the next guy. Okay, let me tell you one other place where this, this becomes important. When you, when you go to Romans 8, uh, I think it's 29, 29, I think it's 29. For those whom he foreknew, them he predestined, et cetera, et cetera. Gang, one of the real debates and one of the real points of conflict between Arminianism and Reformed theology is over that word. What does it mean to foreknow? I mean, does it mean to know certain facts beforehand? It means that God set his love on you before the foundations of the earth. He foreknew you. So when when I come to this, when I come to Pharaoh saying, I don't know Yahweh. Well, what he's saying is, I don't love Yahweh. And to not know Yahweh is to not love Yahweh. And to not know Yahweh is to defy Yahweh. Because you see, it's not about information. It's about intimacy of relationship. So when you come to that word, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to slow down just a little bit. I don't know him. I've never heard the name Yahweh. Is that what Pharaoh is saying? No. In fact, he's got this band of people that lives within his country and they're out there worshiping him on, you know, in, in Egypt. He'd heard the name, but he didn't know him. And people, people find their way into Christian churches with with information, but not knowledge, not yada, because the term yada describes something far more intimate, far more rich and deep, far more relational. Now, you got to have the information to do that, but the information is just the start. 
The information develops intimacy, and that's what the word means. So that's what Pharaoh's saying. I don't know Yahweh. I don't love Yahweh. I defy Yahweh. Wait, because very frankly, in my book, I'm God. That is, in Egypt, Pharaoh was God. Now, so that's, that's the first thing that I wanted you to see. Now, <clears throat> here's the second thing, and with this, we'll finish up. Um, if Moses thought for one minute that he was going to bop into Pharaoh's office and that Pharaoh was going to roll over and immediately play ball to let the nation of Israel go and three days out there and have a worship service, if that's what Moses thought, then Moses wasn't listening. Gang, um, this is from chapter 3. We're in chapter 5. I mean, we're just flying through this. Um, but the, in chapter 3, verse 19, he says, uh, God says to Moses, um, But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. Okay. God told Moses that in 319. We have the first audience in 5-1. And now I want to show you the effect of that audience on Moses. Look at chapter 5, verse 22. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, and he's unable to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. How did he get there? He wasn't listening. And neither are we. Guys, by that I mean this. Christians get so disillusioned so fast when things don't work out in the way they think they should work out. And so part of our disillusionment and disappointment with God is that we weren't listening. God never said to you that this thing was going to be easy. He never said that to Moses. In fact, he said just the opposite. But then when it doesn't go, you know, and Moses is timing and quick and easy and, you know, let's get going. <clears throat> he's, he's fallen into a puddle. Why did you ever send me here? Why did I ever break up with him? I mean, I'm doing exactly what he told me to do. <clears throat> but it just didn't work out the way you thought it was, and now you're disillusioned. Folks, people, Christians, Christians think of the, the, the Christian life like, like driving a car. You know, you get into the thing, you stick your key in the little ignition thing, and you turn it, and you crank it all up, and then you put it in gear, and then you press on the accelerator, and it's supposed to take off in the right direction. But sometimes it doesn't do that, does it? <laughs> Either your car or the Christian life. Yeah. Uh, guys, and once it doesn't, you get all overcome. You know what your problem is? You weren't listening. 
Would you like to hear a little bit of it now? Maybe too late now, but um, let me just read you something that Jesus said. And I, I know you know it's in here, but <laughs> apparently it hasn't gripped us. <clears throat> um, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers, and, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first, down, first sit down and count the cost? Back when you became a disciple of his, did you do that? Were you listening? Apparently Moses wasn't. Because the very thing that God said was going to happen, happened. But he's all overthrown by it. I shouldn't have come. You didn't, you didn't do it in the timing that I thought was appropriate. And then... We think that God has somehow failed us and we're in sore straits and depressed. And... Gang, did anyone ever tell you that a commitment to Jesus Christ that lives under the banner of thus saith the Lord, did anybody ever tell you that that was going to be easy? Did they? then they didn't tell you the truth. Gang. Moses was an enemy of Pharaoh and the culture of Egypt. And so are you. So are we. Folks, we're... we're uh, The most persecuted minority in the entire globe is the Christian church. But I think it's about to get a little bit dicier. But somebody needed to tell you that so that you won't um, collapse under the weight of circumstances that you don't particularly like. You know, have any of you ever bought a home before you sat down and took a look at your budget, look at the, at the payments, what the payments were going to be? Did you, ever, did you ever do that? Of course you didn't. I mean, if you did, you probably found out that you couldn't afford the mortgage payments pretty quick. But of course you sat down and you, you know, you put a pencil to it, you know, and you figured this all out and you said, uh, yeah, well, okay, that'll work. Mm, okay, let's do it. But somehow you have walked into this thing called the kingdom of God to be a follower of, um, of a savior that is non-present at the moment. And when things don't come together the way you want them to, it's just one big complaint. Now, real quickly... Why does God not make it easy? Well, there's lots of reasons, I guess. Um, but I can think of two, and maybe you could think of another four or five. But first of all, all of us, all of us lack so much humility. Can't you just imagine Moses going into the Pharaoh's? you know, sweet. And he's got all these miracles that he's been performing. You know, and, you know, do you know who I am? <laughs> I mean, and I'm, you know, I'm really useful to God because did you see me do that little trick? Um, and so if, if Pharaoh immediately collapses, then Moses is going to think, <clears throat> I'm really something special. But one of the things that he's got to learn is the beauty of and the urgency of humility. And so, 
It doesn't go easily. Now, the other reason, which is not speculation on my part at all, it's found in 2 Corinthians 12. I, I think you know when Paul had the, the, uh, the uh, uh, thorn in his flesh, and he played, prayed three times, oh God, would you get rid of this thing, get rid of this thing? And he said, wait a second, I'm not going to do that. And you know why? I'm not going to make it easy on you, Paul, because I want you to come to the place where you recognize that my grace is enough for you. And that, Paul, the ones I normally use are the weak ones, the broken ones. Because that way, then they all know that I did it and not you. Gang, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this in here because I've got two minutes left. And, and my wife's stomach just overturned um, because it's not in my notes. But I, I mean, I, I bet you've heard this before. I don't, I don't think I'm the only one saying this, so I'm not some kind of great insight on my part, you know. But I think all of your sadness is over the present state of political affairs. so that we will all come to the place where we will realize that our hope, our help is not in a political party. And so we're all going to have to learn. We're all going to learn more about God being our stronghold and our fortress instead of my political leanings. So he's just ripped that away from many of us. So now we're shut up to him. That's why he doesn't make it easy. Let's quit. Our Father, um, would you remind your people that all that you permit and allow into our lives is to make us more into the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, some of the things that you do permit, we don't like. They are uh, hurtful, we think, and, and pointless. And yet, if there is a smidgen of worth of humility that comes out of it, it was worth it. Would you make us into men and women who find our joy in submission to the mind and the word and the will of God. Father, so many of your people believe that the safest place in the world to be is in the center of your will. And we both know that that's not true. And yet, oh God, to be in the center of your will is the best place, and that's where we want to be. But it's not necessarily safe for us, and so we collapse like Moses did, under the weight of the circumstance. Forgive us. Make us people who are uh, confident in the, the dealings of a God who has made promises to us. And might we find our safety and our refuge in those promises and nowhere else. We ask it, of course, in the name of Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. Good to be with you. There is dessert on its way, so hang around and grab some dessert. Thank you for joining us. We hope that tonight has deepened your knowledge and love for our Lord. If you have any questions or simply would love to chat with anyone on our staff, go to our website at graceevan.org. There you will find all of our contact information from Amazing Graceland to our youth ministries, young adults, and our adult ministries. We would love to do our best to answer any questions that you may have. One last thing, we are meeting online and in person Sunday mornings at 9.30 and 11. You can watch us on Facebook, YouTube, and of course, our graceevan.org website. Have a great evening, and we'll see you next week.